100 streets uh, that are named after Dr. Martin Luther King, which is the name for 125th Street. Um, it intersects with three other African-American icons, Frederick Douglass Boulevard, uh, Frederick Douglass, Adam Clayton Powell, and Malcolm X. And I think it's the only place in the country where you have four iconic African-American leaders where they all seem to come together. And it makes sense that they would come together on 125th Street. So with all these wonderful images, what, what happened to Harlem? Well, I'm gonna take you back a bit. We know that Harlem underwent a significant physical change, but it wasn't always the case. That's the same street corner taken in 2004. And you can see how, the how that particular parcel sort of devolved into a deteriorated state. Harlem's population grew significantly in the early part of the 20th century, but especially during the 1930 to 1960 period. At that time, we saw people migrating from the rural South as well as coming in from the Caribbean uh, as well. Many folks were attracted to Harlem because of, the, of its reputation, of a, of a, of a community that was uh, very, where an African American could stay and where they could prosper. Also, it was a place where the Harlem Renaissance took place, and we spoke about that in my earlier remarks. But also because of segregation, Harlem was one of the few places where African Americans could rent apartments. And it was because of that, uh, it led to, uh, it placed significant demands on the community in terms of its uh, infrastructure, in terms of its community resources. And, you know, at, at one time, Harlem really grew to uh, more than uh, maybe 300,000 people or so, uh, maybe even more than that. It was, it placed a significant stress on buildings which were basically tenement style buildings uh, at that time. In an effort to provide better living conditions, uh, the federal government passed uh, legislation both in 1936 and 1954, uh, which basically facilitated the development of public housing. This image shows uh, where public housing was built uh, in both East Central and West Harlem. Uh, you can see uh, the Manhattanville houses here, the General Grant houses here, St. Nicholas houses here, and over here are the Robert Wagner houses, as well as some of the houses that are built uh, between uh, Lenox Avenue, which is Malcolm X Boulevard with the Martin Luther King Jr. houses, and the Jefferson houses located here in East Harlem. Uh, this provided a significant improvement in living conditions for many people that lived in overcrowded conditions. Um, one of the things was that, and this image shows the site plan, and you can show the relationship between open space and the building footprints comprising of public housing uh, campus. And the provision of open space provided more light and air and places where people could have passive and active, active recreation opportunities. And this was a significant improvement over many of the living conditions that people had to uh, deal with at that time. This photograph shows um, a pathway within, I believe, St. Nicholas Park. You can see the relationship between the open space. You can see the grass. You can see this landscape. Um, thankfully, many of these original trees are still there, so they have matured. And we're talking about trees that were planted in the early to mid-1950s. This is now 2020. Uh, it's, it's a lovely, lovely green space, and really, many NYCHA campuses really don't get their due for how, how they were planned and how they were landscaped, particularly under the, uh, the 1954 uh, legislation. But there were issues. One was public housing uh, required significant amounts of site clearance. Uh, this area shows um, a significant amount of public housing, both in central Harlem, which is located just west of Fifth Avenue, and uh, public housing located in East Harlem, located here. This is 112th Street, this is 115th Street, and you can see that this entire uh, section of Harlem is developed with high-rise public housing. Uh, these basically were formerly blocks, probably uh, maybe uh, three blocks per super block, where you had uh, you know, row houses and, and tenement-style buildings on these blocks. Uh, the residents in these buildings had to be uh, relocated. Uh, the houses were demolished to create the super blocks, which facilitated the development of these large 
uh, housing projects. And you can also see that here between Lexington and Park Avenue along here, as well as between Park and Madison Avenue along here. Uh, Superblock public housing uh, really redefined many areas within East and Central Harlem. So the issue here was displacement and disruption of the pre-existing urban fabric. Another reason is that public, hearing, public housing tends to be significantly taller and larger uh, in terms of building scale than the, the pre-existing built context. These are the general grant houses, which are located in West Harlem between Broadway and Amsterdam Avenue. And you can see that these, these buildings rise to about 20 stories. And the, the, premier, the predominant built context was basically five to six story buildings. And you can see there's a significant difference between the grant houses and uh, the surrounding uh, five, six story um, houses that were on neighboring blocks and that were occupied these blocks upon which these houses were built. So even with the passage of, of legislation in the 1950s to facilitate the construction of, of, of public housing, um, you know, Harlem continued to spiral downward in terms of, of physical um, abandonment, physical disinvestment, and financial disinvestment. There were many reasons for that. These are some of the reasons, not all the reasons. Uh, because the community started to deteriorate, we saw the middle class leave, uh, partially because they had the ability to leave because they, they were making uh, enough money to, to, to live elsewhere, but also uh, because of changes in federal housing laws, uh, implementing of anti-discrimination laws, people that could not live elsewhere, Black Americans, African Americans, that could not live elsewhere, had the opportunity to move and leave home. With the flight of the middle class, a black middle class, you also had private disinvestment. Uh, local businesses, barber shops, uh, you know, bakeries, dry cleaners, the types of uh, uses and types of establishments that support and strengthen a community and serve a community, they left. And because of that, the local tax base began to diminish and, and shrink and disappear. Uh, because we had uh, people leaving the community, there was a reduction in municipal services. And uh, so things like street lights and sidewalks, we saw them uh, deteriorate as well. And also with all of this, there's a, there was a similar or sort of a, a you know, a consecutive or co complementary uh, decrease in, um, in the quality of life. Uh, we saw a rise in the negative social indicators and all the things that are listed on this slide, you know, welfare dependency, crime, uh, juvenile delinquency, we saw them rise as well. Public policy um, also um, helped, you know, shape the spiral of Harlem in many, many ways. Um, urban renewal program uh, was used with vigor in uh, East and Central Harlem. And that program uh, used a lot of, um, acquisition of property and clearance of property. Um, what you see here uh, is a full block site in East Harlem uh, that was cleared in anticipation of an urban renewal project. Generally in the 1960s, uh, sites would be cleared for development and they would be developed. Uh, by 1970, the urban renewal program was basically eliminated. So sites that were cleared in anticipation of development uh, did not have the resources to be built, and as a result, they remain vacant. Uh, many of the sites that were cleared in the 1970s remained vacant for nearly 30 years, 25 to 30 years, well into the early to mid 1990s. And that was basically true with this site here. This site remained vacant for about 25 years or so. Here's another shot that shows uh, urban renewal site clearance. Again, uh, you can see this is a full block site that's clear. You can see some clearance here and demolition here, some clearance here, and some clearance here. You can see a significant interruption in the urban fabric, and, um, and with that comes a disruption in the quality of life for the residents that live in this community. Private property owners, uh, seeing that the surrounding community had uh, fall into decay, uh, try to get out, and many of them basically stop paying taxes on their properties. Um, as a result of that, the city would take over the property, uh, residential property, through tax foreclosure. 
Other landlords were more uh, vigorous in trying to dispose of their property, and some of them, many of them, resulted to arson. Uh, this image shows buildings that were set on fire, and arson was a major problem in the city, uh, in Harlem, as well as in the South Bronx in the mid to late 1970s. What's chilling about the image on the right is that we see young people playing basketball, and we see uh, a group of young people looking at a structure that's on fire uh, as almost like it's a, a daily normal occurrence. And in fact, it was a, a fairly frequent occurrence. Uh, the most notable thing uh, that comes to mind is that when uh, the World Series was played, I believe in 1977 or so, uh, from Yankee Stadium, uh, Howard Cosell, uh, who was a sportscaster for uh, ABC, uh, said, uh, you know, the Bronx is burning. Um, and the, the camera would pan away from Yankee Stadium and look towards uh, what's happening on neighboring blocks, and you can see smoke rising from those blocks. So arson was a significant problem. Some landlords would even set the buildings on fire with the residents or the tenants in them. So many tenants had to basically uh, run for their lives to leave these structures that were, that were torched. Um, the city, uh, in many instances, would demolish these buildings um, rather than having a large five or six story vacant building. But that creates another problem. You, you create a vacant lot. And, uh, and there was no money to develop basic parcels. Uh, so you were then basically increasing the degree of blight uh, by doing so. So due to private property, the abandonment of private property, the tax foreclosure, urban renewal clearance, as well as acquisition through eminent domain, uh, the city in the 70s, uh, right up to about 1981 or so, uh, took control of 60% of Harlem's real estate and that included more than a thousand buildings. Um, that's anywhere from 12 to 15,000 apartments that the city had control of. This is shows uh, all the blighted property in Harlem. This was done roughly in 1986 or so, and this was done by hand. Um, in, back in the old days, we did not have ArcGIS or MapInfo or any of the, the mapping software that we have available now. We did everything by hand. And I did this map. Um, we basically did an aerial, and we got uh, you know some colored um, sort of graphic material, and literally pasted on the vacant properties uh, this red tape, uh, and then photographed it. So very old school way, but the image is still uh, quite staggering, seeing the degree of blight and abandonment throughout uh, Harlem. The city, in an effort to get rid of its vacant property, would resort to public auction. And they would have a real estate auction roughly four times a year, once a quarter. And a vacant property, vacant city-owned property, would be offered for purchase. Uh, there were three uh, problems with this. One is that an individual may purchase a, a vacant city-owned lot and then find that they cannot get the financing because of the lot's location. Uh, to build on it. So they would basically walk away from the property, the city would take it over and auction it again, and the same thing would happen. The second issue would be that a person would purchase a property at auction and then maybe invest some money to build it, but find that they were over their head. They did not have enough resources to complete their, their vision and they would walk away from it and the city would take it over and they would re-auction the property. The third scenario is when someone would purchase the property in auction and not do anything with it at all. Uh, they would sit on the property, they would pay taxes, but they would not develop it. And as a, as a resident in an affected community, you know, the outcome was still the same. You had vacant property, you had a vacant lot on your, on your block, on your street, next to where you lived, and nothing was happening to improve the built condition of your neighborhood at that time. So, Public auction really wasn't the best way to incentivize development in these distressed communities, especially in Harlem. So uh, the city um, got involved and developed a redevelopment strategy. Uh, the effort was basically to, to sort of like a multi-pronged approach, uh, identify multiple blighted areas for simultaneous redevelopment. Uh, focus primarily on rehabbing uh, vacant buildings as well as fixing up occupied buildings. Um, 
having a mix of incomes um, moving into these areas, uh, which basically would ensure that a, the, these communities, especially Harlem, would be more economically stable and self-supporting. In 1986, uh, Mayor Koch, um, you know, announced a 10-year housing plan, and the plan was to uh, renovate every vacant building that was owned by the city. It was a very, very ambitious plan. And the Department of City Planning in 1992 had a series of studies, what we call land disposition studies. We identified 26 areas in the city which, which had the highest concentrations of vacant city-owned property. Harlem, uh, East Harlem and Central Harlem had significant amounts of city-owned property as did Brownsville and East New York and, and um, Southeast Queens, Jamaica and, and Far Rockaway. And the goal was to basically not uh, dispose of the property through auction, but to come up with a comprehensive land disposition strategy where the larger parcels would be held and land banked uh, so that when a housing program would be uh, put together by the city and when the funding would be in place, we would have the parcels uh, available for new construction. Uh, in the case of Staten Island, uh, which is located here, um, this area of Staten Island is, is, is not developed and has a lot of marshland and woodland, but was city owned. So the goal there was to not develop it at all, but to create a bluebell system, which is in place to this day, to better control stormwater and rainwater and better control flooding. Uh, it, it was found that a bluebell approach is more efficient than putting, you know, ex expending uh, millions of dollars for, for complicated sewers and, and storm sewers and stuff like that. But the takeaway from this slide is that the Department of City Planning came up with a comprehensive strategy to land bank the larger parcels and to sell off maybe some of the smaller parcels, um, you know, 1,600 square feet or so to an adjacent property owner so they can have a, a garden or some sort of a side yard next to their, their building. This map uh, shows what uh, I did back in 1992 in the Manhattan office. Uh, this shows all the vacant land in Harlem from 110th Street to 124th Street uh, from Morningside Park to Fifth Avenue. Everything that's colored on this map is vacant. Uh, so here, this is Malcolm X Boulevard. This is 116th Street. This is a vacant land. This is all vacant land. Uh, these are vacant buildings. You can see um, the properties on both sides of the street are all vacant, as well as on 122nd Street. Everything here is vacant, as well as along Frederick Douglass Boulevard, which is Fifth Avenue. Tremendous amount of vacancy. Um, as, as, uh, as late as 1992 uh, in, uh, in Central Harlem, South Central Harlem, and we saw the same land use pattern north of here from 125th Street up to 155th Street was essentially the same thing. So the first thing we did, we identified areas that could, where rehab could take place. And these are the streets that had the highest concentration of vacant buildings. Um, the goal was not to do as in the past to demolish, but to uh, fix up buildings and bring them into a state of good repair. And these are some before and after um, photos of rehabilitation. You can see that um, these buildings, even in their deteriorated state, some of them were quite, quite marvelous looking architecturally, and we couldn't build anything like that um, new. You know, so it made more sense to, to rehab them and bring them into a good state of repair so they can be uh, reoccupied. Can I ask a question? Sure. So, um, this is so fascinating also, thank you. But um, who was doing the rehabbing or how did the contracting process work? How involved were, was the city in kind of the details? I'm, haven't, I, I'm ignorant of this. Well, uh, these buildings were primarily city owned buildings and, and thank you for your question. Um, you know, uh, the buildings, um, many of them had to go through a public review process um, as a condition of disposition. So uh, they went through UERP, uh, which involves um, vetting by the 
community boards and by the borough president and city planning commission. So it was an opportunity for the community to see these buildings, hear about the plans of, for them to be redeveloped, renovated. And then, um, you know, the, the city, HPD, the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, would select a developer um, and uh, dispose of these buildings to the developer to, uh, to renovate these buildings. Um, when these buildings were built, there was a, a set aside, a local area preference, where 50% uh, of the units would have to go to uh, Harlem residents, and the residents were selected through a, lo a lottery, uh, which was uh, managed by HPD. Did that answer your question? Yes, sorry, I was telling no to a kindergartner, not to. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your question. And, and, this is a, and this is a conversation also. So if anybody has the question, please, please let me know. I have, a, I, have a, I have a sort of a follow up question. Um, in terms of the financing structure for this, generally, how, how was it set up? If, if, if you know that knowledge, that would be greatly appreciated. Well, the financing came out of the city's capital funds at that time when these buildings were built. Uh, you know, so the Department of Housing Preservation and Development set aside money uh, to renovate these buildings. Do you know if they use like historic tax credits on them at all, or uh, sort of the, 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 ta the tax credits like 421A would come later, uh, mostly for new construction uh, for the most part. Um, you know, so we started seeing um, you know that type of of funding mechanism used for a lot of new construction stuff that we see happen in Harlem. But for the, for the early renovation stuff, the money came out of the city's capital funds. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Amazing times when, when, when public funds would actually pay for rehab straight up. Well, it, it, it was, um, you know, it's, it's amazing that, that we did. Um, but there was, there's a, there was a challenge with this. Um, when these buildings were rehabbed, um, you know, the city's homeless population had grown significantly. And in fact, that there was a, a series of, of court judgments against the city uh, and requiring the city that they must house the homeless. Um, many of the homeless were put in large congregate facilities, uh, such as um, armories, like the, the, like the Bedford Am 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 uh, Avenue Armory in Brooklyn, um, the Kingsbridge Armory in the Bronx, for example. Um, and then, um, you know, nonprofits would offer would also uh, offer space and and redevelop buildings for the homeless. But the issue for us was that since Harlem had a significant amount of vacant city-owned buildings, um, we were afraid that um, many of the homeless that were transitioning or or being taken out of the shelters would be placed into these vacant buildings, and and the community did not want to see you know a significant amount of the of the uh, community's housing stock being uh, renovated for homeless housing, but they, they recognized that the homeless needed a place to live. So a transitional housing uh, plan was, was put together. And what that means is that uh, as people transition from the homeless shelters into regular housing, they would spend time in these transitional residential facilities. Um, as it became clear that uh, the homeless needed permanent housing, uh, the city came up with a program called the Vacant uh, Building RFP Program. And, and in that program, 80% um, of the units would be uh, made uh, permanent for those that were, you know, uh, low income or moderate income, and 20% of the units would be made available for people coming directly out of the shelter system. Um, you know, so there's always this, uh, when we talk about affordable housing, um, you know, there's there's just a, a, a large category of, of constituencies that are vying for that. Um, and, and we grappled with that very early on, back in the, in the late 80s and the early 90s. Uh, and this is an, an ongoing challenge for, for not only planners, but also our colleagues in HPD and, and, and the, that New York City Housing Authority, among other places. So we talked about uh, vacant buildings being renovated. Um, you know, and, and we identified streets where there are significant numbers of vacant buildings that circled in the red. But there was one area in Harlem that was just so devastated and, and so heavily physically distressed that it required a, a comprehensive planning approach different than what was done in the past through 
prior urban renewal uh, protocol and practice. Um, the Bradhurst Community Plan uh, came out of a, out of a, um, a collaboration between churches uh, in Harlem uh, called the Harlem Congregations for Community Improvement, HCCI. And this was the beginning of uh, what we saw an, an uptick in faith-based organizations coming together to create and facilitate community uh, redevelopment plans. We will see the same thing in Southeast Queens uh, with uh, Allen Amy Church. Um, uh, and we've seen the same thing in Brooklyn, East Brooklyn churches with Reverend Johnny Ray uh, Youngblood and Father Gigante in the Bronx, in the South Bronx. Um, Harlem has had um, a history of faith-based organizations working to provide housing. Uh, Canaan Baptist Church, uh, Reverend Wyatt T. Walker uh, was behind that back in the in the 70s and the 80s. So uh, HCCI um, basically, you know, came together, a number of congregations came together to come up with a plan to redevelop Bradhurst. And Bradhurst is the area generally bounded by uh, 145th Street and 155th Street to the north from Bradhurst Avenue over to um, Adam Powell Boulevard. These are photographs that I took of the Bradhurst Ave uh, area. I took these in, in 1996. And one of the things as planners, we try to document um, the existing build condition. And we do that in uh, photographs. We now have uh, you know, cameras, uh, video cameras. Uh, but it's always good, uh, particularly when you're trying to promote development or incentivize development, just, just to you know, take a snapshot and, and make a record of what the conditions were like before. This is 145th Street, looking uh, east towards um, Adam Powell Boulevard, which is 7th Avenue. This is the corner of Bradhurst Avenue and 145th Street. You can see this, this entire uh, assemblage of buildings are vacant. The vacant lot here, and you can see the buildings are budding the vacant lot, all of them are vacant. So the Bradhurst plan, identified sites uh, where new construction could take place. But also, like we saw in the previous images, the plan was not to demolish buildings. The community was very sensitive about the demolition of buildings. So to the extent practicable, buildings that could be saved were saved. Here's a before and after. This is on Bradhurst Avenue. And you can see uh, that, and this is a work in progress, but in the old days, these buildings would have been demolished, but they were fixed up and they were continuing to be worked on. And they sort of look like something you would find in Europe, actually. They're really, there's a really nice, handsome row of houses here. And you find this type of built character throughout Harlem. And, uh, you know, it's, it's so great to see that many of these buildings were saved. Now, this is a new construction project. Uh, like this is on 117th Street. Uh, between Lenox and Adam Powell Boulevard. Um, the entire block front, both sides of the street were vacant and cleared. Uh, these are two story, uh, two and two and a half story brownstone townhouses. These were built in the early 2000s. And these are two family houses. And what's cool about this is that the owner can rent out a unit, uh, the second unit, to help uh, offset the monthly carrying costs. Uh, this was built by the uh, by HPD in collaboration with the New York Housing Partnership, which underwrote the cost of many of the new construction that we saw in Harlem. Um, the, the thing at the time was people that were renting wanted an opportunity to own something. They wanted to own the, the house in which they live. So uh, HPD uh, expanded home ownership opportunity and provided, uh, you know, through many of the projects that were built, an opportunity for people to own where they live. That's a good thing. The downside is that we can't build at this density anymore. Uh, this is too low and we have a housing problem. Uh, we could not and we would not build at this density in 2020. But in 2002, this is what the community was asking for. And you can see that the, the, the building, the, the facade of the building basically tries to replicate um, many elements of what you see in many of the brownstones that you see throughout Harlem. Again, encouraging home ownership, 
Uh, we see a before and after. Uh, in the old days, this building would have been demolished. Uh, it was fixed up, again, through an HPD program um, to bring it to a good state of repair and occupancy. Another example, uh, anytime when you do a, a field survey, if you see a building with an X in a box, that's basically put there by the fire department uh, to alert firemen not to go inside, that there are no floors in the building. They can only fight the fire from outside the building. So that's something you should know if you do field work, if you see that. Also, to keep, it also tells you to keep some distance away from the building from the building because there may be some debris that may fall off the facade. But this is the before and this is the after. Again, this, these two buildings would have been demolished. Um, you know, but they were saved and they were fixed up and it turned out uh, quite well. Now, Frederick Douglass Boulevard um, from 112th Street up to 155th Street was in very, very bad shape. And this, what you see in this image typifies what you saw on most of Frederick Douglass Boulevard, um, large spots of vacant land. Uh, this vacant lot was used as a playground, and you can see a backstop area over here for, for baseball, and you see some benches in here. Um, in 2000 or 2001, uh, the Urban Technical Assistance Project, uh, which is affiliated with Columbia University, and uh, the then Manhattan Borough President C. Virginia Fields came together and created a plan to redevelop Frederick Douglass Boulevard from 110th to 124th Street. Uh, part of that plan was to uh, increase the zoning density to allow for more units. Uh, going from an R72 district, which is a medium density district with a FAR 3.44, to an R6, an R8A district, which will bring the density up to 6.02 FAR. So it's doubling the residential density. Um, UTAP and the Borough President's Office approached us. We uh, supported what they were trying to do, and we actually uh, enhanced it and tweaked it a little bit. And the result is a zoning framework, a zoning um, sort of plan in place that encourages, um, you know, slightly higher density, but within a contextual building envelope. Here's the after. Uh, this is the Harry Tubman Gardens. And what's cool about this, that in the past, when you had a large vacant lot like what we saw, the, the building form would be tower in the park, where the building would be set back to, from the street, surrounded by open space. Here, uh, we have a contextual building where the street wall lines up at the street line. Okay, this building rises to about seven stories or so, one, two, three, four, one, two, yeah, about seven, eight stories. And also what's important with these new construction buildings along Frederick Douglass Boulevard was the provision of ground floor retail where before many of the new housing that was built did not have any retail. We're starting to see, particularly on the commercially zoned avenues, space for ground floor retail and the types of goods and services that would support a growing community. Now, the cool thing about this is that when you, when you build new residential units of a certain number, you have a critical mass of, of residents being brought into the neighborhood, which in turn will support the retail. And that's exactly what happened on Frederick Douglass Boulevard. Um, the other thing of note is that you see an improvement in the street condition. Uh, you see benches, you see street trees. Um, you know, these trees are much taller and they're more mature when, when this photo was taken. But the takeaway is that under the zoning regulations, not only did it require a street wall building and using a contextual building envelope, but it also uh, mandated street trees uh, and benches and street gate improvements to ensure that the public realm, the pedestrian realm, would be inviting in a place where people could spend time and want to stay in. This is a before and after. Uh, this is um, on 118th and 19th at Frederick Douglass Boulevard. Um, and this is the after. This is a Soha, uh, contextual building, street wall building, uh, you know, rises to about maybe eight stories or so, uh, steps down as it heads to the mid block. And this is the back of the building. Uh, we have a yard. Parking is underneath, so the, so the, uh, the yard deck uh, provides the roof for the parking. And you can see um, the backs of these buildings as well. Infill development on the smaller sites, we've been, begun to see also, uh, you know, lots that were, you know, 20 feet wide, maybe uh, even 18 feet wide, we started to see some development on. 
Some of them were pretty funky. Uh, this one is in central Harlem, I believe. And uh, again, uh, it's a street wall building, although it's a different kind of a street wall. Uh, and this is what it looks like looking up from the uh, sidewalk. Um, we're starting to see buildings built to lead standards. Uh, this is at uh, Fifth Avenue and uh, 100 and, uh, 115th Street. Uh, and you can see the ground floor retail spaces there as well. Revitalization of commercial corridors are very, very important. And as I said in my previous remarks, we started to see uh, the introduction of ground floor retail in all of these buildings. And these buildings, these new constructed buildings, were financed through uh, various um, tax, tax abatement, tax incentive programs. This is in East Harlem, uh, I believe at about 100, 101st Street, I believe. Um, you know, contextual building, street wall building with ground floor retail space. Um, bringing in regional, uh, you know, retail, uh, providing a greater variety, um, you know, was very, very important to the community also to serve and complement the new residential development in Harlem. This is Harlem, USA um, at um, 125th Street and uh, St. Nicholas Avenue. And even larger is East River Plaza, uh, which was built on a former um, factory, that, which was taken down. And here we have a number of stores uh, in there and uh, with parking as well. Again, uh, providing the goods and services that community uh, wanted to uh, have been asking for, for for decades, and also to complement the new residential development that's taking place there. Here's some before and after. We talked a little bit about urban renewal site clearance. Uh, these sites were cleared as part of urban, urban renewal. <laughs> Excuse me. And here is the after. Again, the same sites. You can see uh, new buildings, uh, roughly eight stories or so, along uh, Madison Avenue. This is in East Harlem. You can see townhouses, uh, roughly three-story townhouses on many blocks here, 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 and here as well as a, a tall mixed-use building here. And this is Marcus Garvey Park. Now with that, um, obviously, you know, gentrification becomes a big deal. We started to see, uh, you know, more upscale types of businesses coming into the community. Uh, this was, um, you know, Jimmy's, I believe, uh, which was located at 130th and Adam Powell, which was a very popular spot, um, offered more upscale dining than was previously offered in Harlem. Um, and Harlem began to and continue to gentrify with a vigor uh, as people started to uh, be able to purchase buildings for far less than they could, let's say in other parts of Manhattan, and buildings that were, you know, in aesthetically looking pretty good as a matter of fact. They required a lot of money in terms of rehab, but people were willing to put in the money to bring them to a good state of repair. Um, unfortunately, we had um, some property flipping activity. Uh, this is um, Massey Knackle, uh, which was one of the, the big uh, realtors flipping property at the time. And notice the, the prices that these buildings were selling for uh, in 2006. They were selling well over, uh, you know, $1 million, which was totally unheard of uh, prior to uh, this point. But we saw properties, you know, you know, escalating, I won't even say appreciating, escalating in value. And it was primarily because the property was being flipped. Now, this is an image of the George Washington Bridge. And the George Washington Bridge is located in Washington Heights um, or Hudson Heights, depending on, you know, if you're, if you're up around there. But I actually saw this uh, in a brochure selling Harlem. Uh, there, there's still some people who believe that, you know, Manhattan north of 110th Street, all of it is Harlem. So I saw this in a brochure. And, uh, and with that, we start, you start to see certain areas of Harlem being redefined. So North Harlem became NOHA. South Harlem was renamed SOHA. Spanish Harlem or El Barrio, uh, was renamed Spaha. 
or Upper Yorksville or the Upper Upper East Side. 12th Avenue, uh, below the Riverside Drive Viaduct, the area over by Dinosaur Barbecue, uh, over where the Manhattanville campus is being built, was called Viaduct Valley or Viva. So I'm like, you know, you can't, you really can't be serious about this. In 2008, uh, the market crashed. And uh, with that, all the new construction that we saw, the construction activity, those that were not completed by this time came to a halt. There was difficulty getting uh, permits, there was difficulty to get financing. Um, and although construction activity had stopped for a point, it gave the community some time to pause and breathe. Because as, as we've seen in the earlier slides, there was a lot of renovation, a lot of new construction. And, uh, and people felt that, uh, those long-time residents felt that the Harlem that was being created was one which they could not afford to stay in. So with the market crash, it, it basically put the, uh, they put development activity on pause. And that pause lasted for about six years or so. So, and also property, um, you know, transactions stalled as well. Uh, this was taken out of Cranes in December of that same year, um, you know, 2008. So there's basically all, all type of construction or redevelopment activity came to a halt in Harlem, including residential. But we started to see things turn around. So in 2008, this is on 125th Street. Uh, this is right next to the Apollo Theater, big lot. And the after, uh, Red Lobster, um, again, uh, providing a more retail on the street, strengthening the retail presence, and also uh, acting as a complimentary use to the Apollo Theater, where people could have a place to go to before the show or after the show, or if you didn't want to go to a show, you had a place to go to in and of itself. Here's another before and after. This is on Frederick Douglass Boulevard and 125th Street in the North West corner. And this is the after, again, generating jobs, uh, providing expanding retail opportunities to serve uh, people moving into the housing that's being renovated and built in Harlem. This uh, was a result of the um, 25th Street District rezoning. This is the National Black Theater located at Fifth Avenue in 125th Street. It is the um, oldest black owned performance theater. Um, in the country, and uh, they're seeking to uh, demolish their campus, which is here and here, and build a state-of-the-art building, including a, a black box theater and a more modern, larger theater. Um, here, you can see uh, this would be a 22-story building with about 250 mixed-income units and with the theater in the base with some ground floor retail here. Uh, this building is just about completed. It's topped off and uh, it, the inside is being finished. Uh, this is uh, on 125th. Uh, this is a combination hotel and mixed income housing development. The hotel is facing 125th Street, 150 rooms, 150 keys. And on the back on 126th Street, we have uh, a mixed income housing, about maybe 200 units or so of mixed income housing for both low, moderate, uh, and middle income families. Um, they maintain the facade of the old Victoria Theater, so that serves as an entrance to the hotel that's being built there. Um, the hotel is important because hotels bring uh, conference room space and meeting room space, which was something that Harlem lacked for, for many, many years. Uh, new residential development on Fifth Avenue and 110th Street with a museum uh, space in the base. And we're seeing that development proposals are getting more ambitious. Uh, we saw the East River Plaza uh, project. Uh, there was a proposal for an overbuild uh, to build uh, about, uh, I think about a thousand units of mixed income housing on top of the existing uh, retail uh, center. Uh, the buildings are quite tall. Uh, it was met with, with vigorous opposition um, from the community and from the community board and from the elected officials. Uh, but I put this slide in here because we're seeing the same type of ambitious housing 
development as we've seen um, south of here in uh, West Chelsea, Hudson Yards, um, as well as on the other side of the river in Long Island City. Uh, and last, sorry, can, oh, just, just to interrupt, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but it is approaching to, and I think some people are going to drop off for classes. Um, but okay. I think I'm happy to stay. I think a bunch of us are happy to stay on. So just continue, but just so you know, some people might start dropping. Okay. okay. All right. I, I will move quickly. Um, so this is the last thing I think I'm, I'm going to show you. Um, one of the things that we run into as planners, um, you know, we talked about the conflict between, you know, um, or the challenge of providing affordable housing for all. Uh, another thing is when you have a, a legacy site, um, you know, that's being contemplated for redevelopment, how do you treat it? So um, this is the African Burial Ground, Harlem African Burial Ground Project. Uh, it's located where the bus depot, the MTA bus depot uh, was at 126th Street and um, Second Avenue. And um, when uh, they, when DOT was working on the East or the Harlem River bridges, reconstructing them, um, they were using um, this area here as a staging site. And when they were doing some digging, they found uh, some human remains. So they did some, um, some significant archeological work and they found uh, that there is a, a footprint of a, the remnant of a former colonial era cemetery. Um, this, this footprint is about 18,000 square feet, but the cemetery was much larger. And, um, you know, uh, because of that, um, care had to be taken in terms of what to do, how to redevelop the site. Um, plans had already been made to redevelop it for mixed income housing, but now the, th the thinking had to be given towards how to treat um, the former African burial ground which is one of the oldest um, burial grounds in the city. So, Sorry. so they did um, an archeological um, sort of study. They dug three trenches um, within the bus depot footprint and they did not find any intact bodies. Uh, what they found was disarticulated remains. And the thinking is that as development took place over the decades in this area, the, the, the bodies were, were, you know, were disturbed, um, they were uh, damaged, and what you had left were just the, the, um, the pieces, the disarticulated parts of, of the bodies that were, that were buried there. So the plan is, well, first of all, the, the, the souls were removed there being, I believe they're being um, they're being studied somewhere. Um, I, off the top of my head, I don't remember where. Um, but they will be reinterred once the project is built. Uh, the plan calls for mixed income housing, uh, about 800 units, I believe, or so, between 800 and 1,000, I'll say. Uh, the build program includes ground floor retail uh, with um, a community facility space, possibly a museum. Uh, to uh, complement the uh, the burial ground here, and the, it, the footprint of the burial ground uh, would remain undisturbed in terms of it not being built over, uh, so it'll be open to the sky. Um, and similar to um, what was done with the colonial burial ground down um, in Lower Manhattan by uh, by the federal building, where that uh, burial ground is open to the sky. And, and not built upon, but there is a museum uh, that explains what happens there, the history of that site located on Broadway within the, the federal building that, that fronts on Broadway. And uh, one last thing um, is that uh, we found out through uh, Storm Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, that um, New York City can be affected by the same um, you know, coastal storms that affect Florida and, and the Carolinas uh, and the Gulf Coast. And uh, it was a wake up call uh, to uh, think about not only rebuilding those areas that were heavily damaged, but also how to build better. Um, so in terms of housing, uh, this is just an, old, an image of the Rockaways uh, after Storm Sandy. 
Uh, you can see the entire boardwalk was taken out um, as well as the beach. Uh, the, the power of the ocean uh, is, is absolutely is remarkable and it's beyond words. Um, however, you know, for those who choose to live in areas that are close to the ocean, um, with the advent of, of um, sea level rise coupled with climate change, uh, we had to build better. We have to think about building better, particularly, um, you know, residential development. Um, this image shows the, the flooding. This is Esplanade Gardens in Harlem. Uh, the subway station, which is 148th Street uh, and Lenox Avenue, uh, was completely flooded. It was under, I believe, about four feet of water or so, and was offline for a very long period of time. This shows uh, the storm surge. Um, when people th think about the storm surge, they think about areas like the Rockaways and Staten Island and, and Brooklyn, like Mill Basin being affected. But the storm surge also came as far north as Harlem. And you can see in the pink, the areas where you saw uh, the water uh, coming in off the river. This is the 100 year, the projected 100 year. Um, you know, sort of um, uh, flooded, flooding. Uh, and you can see that uh, a lot of East Harlem is um, threatened. And as well as part of, uh, this is East Harlem right here, um, as well as the Northern part of Central Harlem. Uh, not so much in West Harlem, because most of it is on, a, is on a bluff or an elevation, at a higher elevation than, uh, than uh, East Harlem in central Harlem. So in terms of building a residential development, um, we have to think about sustainability and resiliency, storm resiliency, in addition to affordability, so that these structures will remain, um, can, can withstand um, these storms that we expect to, to see and, and uh, sea level rise that we expect to see in the future. So, a few closing thoughts. One um, is that, you know, as with any community, uh, the people are its strongest asset. So, um, you know, the community should have a collaborative role in uh, what their future should be. Um, you know, residents should have, Harlem residents should have an equity stake um, in their neighborhood and uh, expanded uh, rental and uh, commercial development opportunities at home office ownership opportunities are very, very important. Um, community development should be that balance, and you guys know this, between preservation um, of uh, culturally significant and architecturally significant buildings and, uh, and new development. In addition to providing affordable housing for low and moderate and middle income uh, families, we have to think about um, the, more, the more vulnerable residents, uh, people with HIV AIDS, um, formerly incarcerated individuals. This becomes very, very important with the proposed closing down of Rikers Island. Um, you know, these inmates will need a place to live after they complete their census. Uh, war veterans returning from Afghanistan, um, you know, war veterans, uh, military personnel mustering out of the military uh, will need a place to live, um, as well as the, the mentally ill and, uh, and those that are uh, victims of domestic violence. All of these individuals require affordable housing, and we have to be creative in terms of providing opportunities, expanding opportunities for these populations as well. Green design uh, is very, very important. We saw one building uh, that had it, but there are many, many buildings that are being built to lead standards. Um, and in fact, all buildings that are built with, uh, with uh, public money are required to adhere to some lead standards. Um, but also e equally significant is that for low-income housing, that um, they should be built to better design standards. They do not have to be a big brown box and that some attention to detail and attention to the aesthetics uh, should be given in a matter almost similar to what you do with market rate housing. Uh, there's no reason why a person in a low income, making low income or no income should live in a building that's sterile or, um, 
or not or not pleasing to the eye. Nor should they um, be uh, walking through a poor door in a in a building where they're in a unit where it's mostly market. You know, they should be able to walk in through the main entrance just like anybody else. And um, you know, improvements to the to the public realm, streetscape improvements, uh, uh, public space, open space, whether it's community gardens, playgrounds, uh, places where people can gather and enjoy. Um, you know, the uh, the natural environment. Um, you know, is very very important. And, and Harlem is blessed in that we have coastline, uh, we have esplanades along the Harlem River as well as the Hudson River. Um, so we have opportunities to see that as well as. Um, enjoy Harlem Mirror in uh, in Central Park. Um, so open space is is, is incredibly important. Um, so looking at the community holistically, and not just focusing on the on the on residential development, looking at all development in a complementary way, is, is something that's very very important. So that basically concludes what I have to say. I want to thank you all for for uh, bearing with me. I, th I think I ran a little bit over, um, but uh, I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Hi, uh, first of all, uh, incredible information. Um, and uh, I'm relatively new to New York, but this is simply phenomenal and awesome information. Um, I did have a, I have a few questions. Um, the first one is, um, for all of the, the, the different rehab projects that were uh, completed um, in around Harlem, is there like a master sort of Excel spreadsheet that has like all the different projects and like when they were completed and like how many units were part of each project or just if we, if we maybe want to do some research on those or? Well, I, um, I don't know if there's a master one. Um, you can, um, Contact the Manhattan Planning Office. Um, my colleagues there, they might have something. Um, you can start with them and um, they might be able to, um, you know, go through the files and provide something for you. Uh, another, another place to go to would be HPD. Um, you know, HPD may have some information and actually that might be a very good place to start actually, um, HPD. Um, and see what they have. I'm sure they, they track this stuff uh, or they might have some institutional knowledge of it. So I would, I would recommend um, HPD, but I also recommend reaching out to the, the Harlem Planner in the Manhattan Planning Office at DCP. Awesome. Um, and then for the, um, for the Harlem African Burial Ground, did that enter like a Section 106 process at all or... Um, did uh, was there any sort of further? I didn't. I didn't know if like because was any of that project uh, did it, rec did it uh, contain any sort of federal funding at all, or was it all private funding? That is a uh, it's a city project. Okay. Um, there is a, a community based task force um, that is involved, and I do know that they do receive some funding. Um, you know what I can do uh, through Joe. Uh, I can find, I can get that information for you and I'll forward it to Joe and then Joe can forward it to you. Okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And then for like, so I'm really, um, so I'm from New Orleans and I'm all too familiar with, with hurricanes and flooding and FEMA maps, base flood elevation maps, all that sort of thing. And so mm -hmm. to see that map for, uh, projecting the 21, you know, the sea level rises uh, in, in the year 2100 is sort of shocking. Uh, considering New Orleans, a large portion of the city is below sea level. Mm -hmm. um, and it just sort of indicates that there are other areas in the country that are uh, also at risk. Um, but I was curious if the city is, is creating or has the idea or uh, at least perhaps is in like preliminary discussions about not so much limiting development in those areas that are projected to be underwater in, I guess, what, 80, 80 years? Um, or, or maybe perhaps um, encouraging the development of some additional or like revised building codes to sort of mitigate against that uh, rising water in those areas. You, you, are, you are so totally spot on. Um, you know, we actually have that. Um, what happened was um, when Storm Sandy hit, um, you know, two things happened. Um, one, um, you know, properties were destroyed 
and we, we found in, in going through uh, each of the five boroughs that there are some areas that should, should have never been uh, developed from the onset. So uh, in those instances, in those areas, and many of them were in Staten Island um, along the, uh, what they call the, the, the South Shore, it's actually the East Shore, but they call it the South Shore, uh, places like Midland Beach, South Beach, Oakwood Beach. Um, and it's, and the, the condition there is similar to New Orleans, where as you proceed from the uh, beach, uh, the, the land dips below sea level. So it's like a soup bowl, and then it rises up again as it gets up to, as it heads further inland. Uh, many of those properties um, were um, purchased by, um, by the state and the city of New York, and the homeowners were compensated. So, and there was legislation passed to ensure that nothing will be built in those areas. Um, so there'll be natural areas. Um, you know, and it, these are areas that have a historic, a long history of flooding. So it's, they were they were dealing with flooding long before before Storm Sandy, um, you know. And there are other areas in in the city uh, where building will not uh, be allowed because of, of what happened. Um, the second thing is the city passed a series of of regulations where um, where the buildings will be more resilient to um, storm surge. So for example, like in New Orleans, for example, um, many of the buildings have been elevated. Um, you know, so the first floor is literally one story above grade. Um, for new construction um, in New York City, uh, you, the buildings have to be elevated uh, a certain, to a certain height. Um, the first floor, the ground floor, cannot be an occupiable floor, um, you know, so you can have maybe like a garage or, or something where the water can flow through, but you cannot have a, a, an occupiable floor on the ground floor. Um, for commercial places, commercial districts like lower Manhattan, um, storm doors, um, you know, storm shutters, flood, flood uh, shutters and flood um, gates are, are in place so that they will hold back the water in case, you know, we have the same degree of flooding that we had with Storm Sandy. So the short answer to your question is that there has been new regulations and new statutes, both in zoning and in the building code, uh, to um, to make it, to make it uh, you know obligatory of owners that want to stay in these particular areas to to uh, strengthen their buildings and, and flood proof their flood proof their property, um, you know. And then there are other areas where you, you know property owners will not be allowed to build, rebuild at all because the, the risk is just too great. Um, if you live in a floodplain, uh, you have to have some degree of flood proofing on, on your property. Um, there's a cost to that, um, you know, obviously, because it's not cheap. Uh, flood insurance is not cheap, um, but, um, you know, it's something that has to be done. Uh, and, and, and sort of as an aside, um, I am, um, I'm in upstate New York um, here. And uh, I am not far from Phoenicia, um, New York. And Phoenicia is many miles inland from any body of water, but it's surrounded by um, creeks and mountains, the Catskill Mountains. And uh, Phoenicia, uh, when storm, um, when tropical storm Irene came to the metropolitan area, it, it bypassed the city, but it slammed upstate New York and Massachusetts and Connecticut. So the towns up here, um, which are, as I said, many, many, many miles inland from an ocean or a river or the Hudson River are also incorporating to various degrees how to make their, their properties more resilient from, from rising floodwaters and stuff like that. Um, you know, so it's something that many communities are looking at, not just the coastal cities. Thank you for, thank you for that very thorough response. I appreciate that. I, and I'm really happy to hear that New York uh, has taken very pragmatic approaches to like, you know, uh, you know, flood water and rising water, rising sea level uh, mitigation efforts. You know, Louisiana, post Katrina, you know, the state formed something called the Louisiana Recovery Authority. And uh, it unfortunately was not as successful as, you know, what, what the state has done. I mean, it did allow people to actually rebuild in very low lying areas, which is really unfortunate. Um, but uh, I'm really happy to hear that there are states that are being very smart. <laughs> so. Well, we we were we were you know 
it was like a wake up call of, of the most extreme, uh, in the most extreme way, um, you know, and um, it, it's just like, it's like the same thing with, um, with earthquakes here. When people think of earthquakes, they think of California, they don't think of, you know, the New York metropolitan area being subject to earthquakes or that the, the city's on a seismic fault. Um, but there is a seismic uh, fault running under 125th Street over by the Manhattanville campus. And one of the things that uh, Columbia had to do was they had to ensure that the buildings that are going up as part of the Manhattanville campus, um, you know, adhere to seismic standards, um, you know, because the earth does move from time to time. Um, and to make things, if things weren't complicated as in a park, very much complicated, um, all of the Manhattanville project is built in a bathtub similar to the World Trade Center. Um, you know, so they had to build a bathtub first and then construct it on top of that or within it. Um, you know, so they had to, and also because they're close to the river, they have to um, meet the resiliency and sustainability uh, stuff um, regarding flooding and things of that nature. Yeah. So yeah, these are the times that we live in. Um, in terms of housing, it drives up the cost of housing. You know, making a house, making uh, affordable housing resilient, um, there's a cost to that, um, you know, but it's something that we have to embrace and figure out how to, to make it work. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll just say one other thing. I'll let, I'll let sorry. Um, Actually, yeah. I think, sorry, um, sorry. To interject, but I do think we're going to have to go fairly soon. So I'm just going to pass it over to, to Joe um, briefly. Oh, well, I was just going to interject to say the same thing that I think sensitive to using up more time um, since we've gone over quite a bit, but if it's okay, Edwin and Eric, is, if it's okay to maybe just have one, one other quick question from someone. Sure. Uh, hi, Edwin. Hi. Hi, Edwin. Uh, thanks so much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering whether you could speak a bit more to what you think might have allowed the Frederick Douglass Boulevard rezoning to kind of successfully make its way through ULERP. Uh, I feel like in the past couple of years, we've seen other rezonings like the rezoning of Inwood and then more recently with Industry City mm -hmm. um, get stalled or canceled. And I was kind of curious if you thought there was like some specific ingredients that made that rezoning possible. Oh, well, well thank you for your question. Um, several things made that rezoning possible. The first thing was that it was a proposal that was brought to the department from um, from the community or from an organization that was uh, held in high regard by the community. Um, in the case of Frederick Douglass, it was uh, uh, UTAP, the Urban Technical Assistance Project, um, which was affiliated with Columbia at that time. It still is, I guess. Um, you know, uh, they did the- it, it actually is interesting. It, sidebar, sorry, kind of disbanded. Nobody oh. knows about it at GSAP, but apparently oh. it was kind of like a housing lab but before our time and actually mm -hmm. did a lot of stuff. We need yeah. to learn about it. Yeah, they did a lot of stuff. They work with communities on, on, on community-based plans and, 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 um, and they worked on a Frederick Douglass Boulevard uh, uh, plan. And, um, and they went to the Manhattan Borough President, C.J. Virginia Fields, and she uh, was a council member that represented Harlem, central Harlem. Um, you know, and she said um, she would support the plan if you go to city planning. Um, and the plan basically was um, upzoning, a slight upzoning uh, to a contextual zoning district uh, from an R72 to an R8A. Um, and on the mid blocks, um, you know, R, R7A um, between Lenox and 7th and between um, 7th and 8th, I believe, um, maybe slightly lower, maybe R7A and, and R6A around 123rd Street, we have brownstone, low, low rise brownstones. Um, you know, so it was a, uh, a very nuanced rezoning proposal, respecting the differences in building scale and density between the mid block and the avenues. Um, you know, we embraced it, um, you know, because it came to us uh, from outside. It wasn't like the city was coming out to the community it was something that came from the community to us. Uh, and UTAP had done the work. They had advisory committees and advisory groups working with the community boards um, to get that consensus that they needed. Um, they also put out a document as well, Frederick Douglass Boulevard, a plan. You know, they should, it should be in the, 
in the in the university's um, you know archives about that because there's a considerable amount of scholarship put into that. Um, the third thing is that it was all vacant land. I mean, it was vacant land, vacant buildings. So it, it, there was no issue of displacement because there was nothing to displace. Um, you know, there was no, um, you know, it didn't require demolition. It didn't require um, uh, re relocation or anything. We're basically building on sites that had been vacant for 20 or 25 years. Um, you know, so it was very easy to sell that, um, you know, as opposed to um, a, a plan that would require some relocation, um, you know, or displacement. And this plan did not have that. Um, people wanted to see something happen on Frederick Douglass Boulevard. They saw construction activity happening south of 110th Street and other parts of the borough, and they felt it was time um, for development to occur there. And also, um, we had a mayor that was pro-development. Uh, we had uh, Mayor Giuliani, uh, who was a two-term mayor, um, and he was succeeded by Mayor Bloomberg, both mayors, um, you know, were pro-development and both mayors had, um, you know, strong connections with the real estate community in the city to be able to facilitate those connections to get things done. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, so as a result, um, the plan was fully embraced. And the plan, uh, in terms of ULERP, it was approved unanimously by Community Board 9, Community Board 10, the Manhattan Borough Board, uh, the Manhattan Borough President, the City Planning Commission, and the City Council. And it's very rare that you have unanimous approval of a, of a plan, a rezoning plan, by everybody. Usually you have one person dissenting or something like that, but it was unanimous across the board. Um, you know, uh, so it was, um, we were very, very happy uh, that we were able to uh, achieve that outcome. Um, and um, now you can walk on Frederick Douglass Boulevard um, safely. Um, the only um, thing that I wish we had, we did not have the the, um, the, 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 the wherewithal to do it, was it to maybe increase the amount of affordable housing rather than having it 20% affordable, maybe have it maybe at 30% affordable or something like that. 50-50 um, would not fly in that environment at that time. You know, you had to provide, um, it had to be skewed towards market rate as opposed to having half and half um, to get something built. Um, but in hindsight, I wish we were, had to come up with a more clever way to maybe up the percentage of affordable units. Um, but I, I, I'm very happy to see that, that strip of land, uh, that, that boulevard redeveloped to what it is now. Uh, it was just awful uh, before. Got it, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so, so much, Edwin. I think we could probably keep talking for hours um, and hours. There's so many questions. Bernadette wrote in the chat that if you have any burning questions, participants, and you want to throw it in the chat, we'll log them and maybe follow up with them, Edwin, future date. But uh, I think we just do want to be sensitive to everyone's time um, and cut this now. But thank you, Edwin, so much for what was truly like a master class, I think, of <laughs> Harlem history that's so important, should be required uh, viewing for anyone entering GSAP. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Joe. So I really appreciate it, I think we all do, and um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you, and um, you know, I guess, if, you know, if there's any follow-up questions, uh, Joe, you'll, you'll forward them to me, and I, I'll and answer them and, and get the questions uh, uh, back to you. I do have one. Uh, Are you one really offering that? Because that would be amazing, but we have no, a lot. <laughs> no, I mean, really, I mean, really, um, uh, you know, you. Plan planners like to talk, as, <laughs> as you can tell, um, you know, so if there's any follow-up questions, you know, shoot them to Joe and he'll shoot them to me. I do, I do um, want to follow up with uh, one of your colleagues had a question about the African burial ground and uh, how it was financed and stuff like that. So, um, that I should be able to find out fairly easily. But if there's any other questions, please, um, you know, forward them to, to Joe and he'll, he'll forward them to me. Yeah, I can compile a, a list. Yeah, that's, yeah, that'll, that'll be, that's very generous. That'll, that'll, that'll be cool, yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much. And mm -hmm. uh, thanks to everyone who attended. And uh, as Bernadette mentioned at the beginning, we have these every Friday. So feel free to tune in next Friday at one. So thank you.
Love to have you there too, Thank Edwin, so next much. Friday if you want to join. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, you know what? If if you if there is um, if you want me to, to, to chat again, uh, by all means, reach out to me. Um, and this, this has been cool. This has been great. And, um, you know, and, uh, and thank you. Thank you again. Thank you again. Take care, everyone, and stay safe. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.